eyes may be able to see, but without a heart, you cannot fit. What's up, everybody? This is George Yossi Samuels, and you are tuning in to It Will Come Chats, um, a special segment of the It Will Come show. Uh, where we actually interview folks, and when I say we, myself, um, around, really, it's, it's Joe Rogan style, right? Where I'm just going to be uh, sitting down with people I know, uh, see uh, what their insights are, um, what their strengths are, you know, their views on the world, their views on their their craft. Um, and so I just, I hope you enjoy, because there's definitely been a lot of chats that I have with folks in general, where uh, they seem to turn into things that I always find could be useful for other people. And so this is just part of uh, that um, and then part of uh, me wanting to share a lot of these intimate conversations that I have with people. Um, So without further ado, um, the chat that I'm actually sharing with you actually took place yesterday, um, but uh, we managed to record it. Uh, It's with uh, a good brother, uh, Kevin Pham. Uh, who you know shares a few uh, similar interests uh, around communities, relationships, families. Um, we knew each other from the Bitcoin world, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I hope you enjoy the the, the chat. Um, he was actually interviewing me, uh, but there are some things that we shared that I think would be of use uh, to to everybody. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the interview. Yep, awesome. Yeah, starting. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to ask you, I kind of value your perspective because uh, you're outside of the uh, American echo chamber. <laughs> yeah. but, but at the same time, I, I think we share a lot of, you know, cultural kind of values. So we can kind of like, you know, be on the same page. So yep. I don't know if you can, it seems everything is hyper partisan right now. Everybody's it's like a war shark test. Everybody's looking at the same thing and then they're totally interpreting it in different ways. So, you know, a white person inciting a riot mm. from the left it would be a white supremacist that's undercover, that's trying to incite, and then from the right, it's radical leftists yep. that are, you know, inciting it, you know, for, you know, foreign interests and stuff. So, yeah. Being, being in uh, Singapore, yep. uh, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective. Um, sure. Okay. So, I guess just going off of that, um, and I guess to begin with, from the outside looking in, and just some context as well, right? Like, I've been raised with uh, pretty much my most of my schooling was at an American international school, so I think mm-hmm. that's where I'm familiar with the American culture and sort of you know the, the belief systems. Um, I know freedom is definitely a big value, right, um, for Americans. Uh, but I think in terms of observing like s- multiple different cultures and multiple different countries, right. In the United States, the the system itself of politics is divisive just by its nature too, right? Towards the end, when you're coming down to electing a single president, um, it's it's blue versus red, you know. And so you always have this uh, split um, of beliefs. Everything gets narrowed narrowed down, right? And one thing I was fascinating is that like I heard a story about like in the United States, there's been an increase in families sort of uh, you know judging. Uh, spouse spouses you know for their kids based on which political um, leaning they have right which is and and it's getting so bad it you, you might as well be racist <laughs> right because the yeah. way that they would would talk like oh my god they're Republican nope you're definitely not marrying him or her you know yeah and, it's like and, a, a religious war yes somewhere. yes um, and you know we we try to separate church from state but I think because church is tied to religion and religion is such a big part of even you the, like the the american way of life right you know like the christian values right um and because that was there from the beginning it just sets the it's it has set the tone right um i look at singapore um it's very interesting because uh, i even had this conversation with my partner last night and she was talking about like a friend of hers being very anti-racist and i compare that to singapore Singapore doesn't use anti-racism. They have racial harmony. And, you know, the, the, the use of words is important, too. Because even the anti-whatever, whatever it is you are anti, it will always have to exist for you to be anti-that. Right? And so that yes. is just a perpetual... It, it, it's, it's in its nature rivalrous combat. Yes. Because you are... 
the opposite of something else. Correct. Whereas you, 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 you know, I think what Lee Kuan Yew did for Singapore set a very good foundation for itself for the future. It didn't use that type of languaging, right? Um, yes. it, it used racial harmony, which is, and it's not perfect. Of course, there's still like, I mean, we're human beings, right? So you still got a very strong Chinese population in Singapore, but there are equally um, as many in terms of numbers, Indians, Malay, Eurasians, etc. cetera. Uh, so here you, I mean, I think there is discrimination, but I think it's moved beyond race. Uh, now it's going to be more around just sort of uh, your economic status, right? And so this is this is uh, very interesting. I don't know if we'll ever be able to remove that because a lot of us want to always feel special, feel unique, and that causes a separation or differentiation, right? Um, with the United States, uh, just looking at the bipartisanship, um, I think it is... I mean, again, this is an observation, hyper, right? Hyper bipartisanship. Yes, hyper. Um, yeah, back, back in the day, like, people had, people were, were more cordial. There was a little bit more common ground. People were, you know, at each other's throat and just, you know, playing. Correct. Um, um, yeah, I, I think the economics definitely has a huge part to play in it, too. Back then, you know, you had a strong middle class, too, right? Um, the, I think the, sort of gap that has increased in, in wages and, and, and whatnot has also increased people's need to cling to something that they feel they have some sort of control over, right? Yeah. And political leanings is one of them, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, just seeing what's happening in the U.S. right now, um, I'm not surprised, but it's still shocking, right? Uh, the fact that it... And then there was a time there was a, um, a meme or something going around showing like a time cover, right? Where it showed like uh, the police versus, you know, blacks in 1968 and it's crossed out. And then it said 2005 or 2015, cross that out. And now it's 2020. It's the same shit, different smell, different generation, you know? Um, and so I think it's just all of these sort of underlying issues that, you know, it seemed like there was progress, but really at a fundamental level, like there was no change. And it's just, again, the quarantine, um, the isolation, I think just also made people agitated. So shit, you know, the rioting um, and what's happening now is just a, a symptom of that. You know, people were just, uh, freedom's restricted, right? Um, again, because it's a big value. So this just gave another reason for people to go out, protest, and also just let loose, you know, um, air their grievances. Unfortunately, some of it's being rioting and looting. Hmm. So, like, I don't know, I think being in America, I'm biased to have an uh, optimistic outlook. For and sure. I don't know if that's me, just me talking my book because I don't have, you know, property in Singapore. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, know, I noticed that too. I do have friends that are outside or they're expats now and mm. they're kind of egging on, you know, the civil war because, mm. you know, they already kind of got like skin in the game. Yep. Um, so, like, yeah. what... what Yep. Okay. So the outside looking in, man, you know, to be honest, I think uh, the United States suffers potentially, if you look at sort of the, maybe the overall consciousness of the nation, suffers from the same uh, issues that many great empires in the past have suffered from, which is arrogance, right? Mm. Um, now, the, the arrogance is, is justified, right? Because uh, America has been a great empire country for a good time. But again, you know, we all know what happens with arrogance, right? Eventually it becomes the, your downfall as well. And so from the outside looking in, I think that uh, being optimistic is great. And also you have to be optimistic, right? Because if you're not like, you still live in the United States. So you, you want and, to- and, also, and I see that there's like a, a balance of power between, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a little bit more totalitarian states that are more into, you know, policing thought and speech yeah. and the free world. And I'm seeing, you know, Hong Kong falling basically. Yep. And Taiwan is, you know, seems to be, you know, on the brink, you know, I think if, you know, they don't have the support of the U S yeah. then you know, it's a trivial, trivial kind of military uh, invasion. So mm. that, that, that's what kind of scares me. And also being in Singapore, 
you know, I, I think you guys are, my intuition is you guys are kind of tucked between two great nations. Yep. And uh, I would say that, you know, your values do lean more towards uh, Americanism, but there is a lot of culture, you know, Asian, you know, Confucian culture. Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, uh, freedom isn't as, uh, you know, as a core value. Well, I would say not a, not a value, but it, yeah. it's not a kind of a... Um, it's lesser than some others, right? Like, yes. It, so if I was like to look at... Security. Correct, correct. I would definitely say that as a nation, like Singapore is definitely more on the, um, yeah, stability, security, and harmony uh, parts, right? So it does make for a very orderly society, right? Like, um, I'm... <laughs> let, me, let me show you this as well. So this is where I'm currently... Let me just get rid of my virtual background. All right. This is where I am right now. All right. And yeah. every, everything is just, um, you know, like just modern. Um, it just feels so advanced. It really is often like it feels like a, a utopia. Right. But the, the downsides of that, too, is that there are, especially from locals, they'll say like, yeah, a lot of this is just a facade. Right because there's other things that happen that just gets wiped out or taken care of with, without you really hearing about it, about it or, or knowing about it. And so that's always the danger. I think the reason why this worked with Lee Kuan Yew was the whole benevolent dictatorship, right? Yep. If you have a good leader in a dictatorship, it actually fucking works very well. Yeah. But, but um, yeah. yeah, but of course there's that danger. And I think the United States is uh, definitely from a system standpoint. It's uh, more resilient. Correct. Um, but it's also more resist. I, I feel like there's a little bit of rebelliousness just always inherent in American culture, right? Yep. So any, it's anti-authority, right? Mm -hmm. Which you can see when it comes time to a crisis, actually, that, is, that doesn't help. Because if we look at COVID-19, the countries that have done very well are the ones who have actually had a little bit of authoritarianism, right? Yeah. Made it easier to coordinate, um, and it made it easier to tackle shit and um, quickly. Yeah. So I, I did a tweet that I said that, you know, America's rebellious culture is great for resisting authoritarianism. Yes. Horrible for fighting pandemics. Yes. I, I think that's well said. And, and this is where I am. And, and one, and one thing I want to emphasize mm. is that I hate when people do an apples to apples comparison to other countries. Yeah. And what I want people to respect is like individuals, different countries have different personalities. 100%. And they have different circumstances 100%. and they have different histories. Yep. And you have to understand all those things to figure out what's right for that nation as opposed to just right. having a blanket, you know, either this socialist state is great or this democratic state is great or this monarchy is great or whatever. Correct. And I think that's also where I have the issue sometimes. Like I know in the U.S. is a huge resistance to socialism. Right. And because I am more on the, the Taoist, like Confucian yin yang style. Right. And I know we've, we've talked about this a little, but I think there's a time for individualism and there's a time for collectivism. Right. And we have not yet figured out how to have some sort of government type that has the wisdom to distinguish between the two for different times. Because we do know about like there are wartime leaders and uh, peacetime leaders. Right. Yep. So why can't so we find... need to be a little bit more moving as a collective. Mm. And then during peace time, generally speaking, you can be a little bit more lib that... you know, lib liberalized. Agreed. I, I, I think um, I definitely would uh, lean to that um, because you can see where... So exactly, what's working for Singapore right now may not work in the long run, right? For now, I think they have very good foundations, has worked for this pandemic, um, I think it will work for a good couple decades, but after that, if they don't, it's just looking at like seasonal cycles, right? All nations. And I think all cultures have that too. And as you move through them, you're going to need like a different approach. And I think the United States has been moving to more like collectivism, right? You've seen the rise in populism, et cetera. Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I talk about family a lot on yeah, Twitter yeah. and what I'm discovering is that during times of uncertainty, we retreat to safety yep. and familiarity. Yep. Um, 
Whereas, when, yeah, when things are more stable, then we're able to kind of, yeah. And you can kind of see, you know, everybody's leaving the cities and kind of going back home to the suburbs, their family, yeah, and stuff like that. So I think it's, I agree with you, it's about identifying the cycle. Mm. And I think the cycle that we're in right now is one of uncertainty. Yeah. So then, therefore, that leads to more collectivist, um, you know, uh, meetings. meetings. Yep. Correct. And I, and I think this goes back again, right, to just even the, the, the race issue at the moment. It's, it's not about being like anti-racist or anti this or whatever. It's like being able to see the colors, right? Being able to respect the colors. And w if you're looking at sort of the collectivism and individualism too, it's like being able to see those uh, thought patterns, right? And those belief systems and respecting it because they serve a purpose at different times. Um, Definitely right now, I think the biggest shocker, I think for uh, many, if, uh, you know, everybody's retreating to the families and homes, but if they have no families and homes to go to, that has caused yeah. a lot of issues too. Like I know people where that has been the case, you know, and they've yeah. really had to reevaluate their lives and their relationships. Yeah. And um, to kind of tie it to Bitcoin, I did a tweet where I kind of said, like, I'm less prone to groupthink because I have a family outside of Bitcoin. Yep. And what I'm finding is that people are trying to find community and, and acceptance in things that are not family, whether it's political affiliation um, or yes, being, an, yeah, being a certain enthusiast of a, of a certain thing. And I, I don't necessarily think those, those things are ideal because yes. I think those are um, vectors to where people can be uh, preyed upon. Manipulated. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people kind of hate on, you know, the social justice warrior left. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I live in, you know, the Bay Area near San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And you, mostly what I see are victims. Um, women that were victims of sexual assault. Yep. Either adults or children. Yep. Um, gay people that were ostracized from their families and communities. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, marginalized minorities. Yep. And then they feel like they have no home. And then you have, you know, maybe, you know, democratic leaders or something that say, Hey, we will take you in and take care of you yeah. and whatnot. When in reality, they just see them as, you know, vulnerable people that they can kind of use. Yep. That's... Yep. Um, I mean, I think I, I do agree with uh, some people's sentiments about like, you know, if we actually focus on fixing our homes and our families that might help fix many other problems. Right. Um, and again, it co comes, comes back to some of the economics, um, you know, technology advances to, you know, people flooding to major cities for work. But, you know, we're seeing now where uh, many people have also been able to work from home, right? And I think it's being pushed there. And what that will mean is, I think in the future, it will mean that workers may be able to actually stay closer to home, right? To yep. sort of yeah. fix their family life, right? Because proximity, um, I think I'm a fan of like... Uh, physical um being like in terms uh, what is it like global i'm a, i'm a flan, i'm a fan of globalization ah digital mm -hmm. um globalism uh mm -hmm. but physical localism right nice. so it's like we can still participate in the global market and economy but we need to like restructure our sort of infrastructure in a way that uh we can still stay with our families and our friends and whatnot in local neighborhoods right <clears throat> but have the access exactly you know, um, and I think it is very important, actually, for people to be able to um, venture out and see what the outside world is doing, because that also makes uh, humbles you. Right. Um, and I, I think when it when it comes to like the family, sound family side of things um, now, a lot of people, yeah, have been realizing, oh, yeah, you know, I think what really matters to me is like catching up with my old family and, and friends who I haven't spoken to in a long time. And those are the same questions you ask yourself before you die, you know? So it's really like this whole situation has just taken away all of the non-essential. And when you look at what is essential, you start to realize like, actually, yeah, a lot of the things that we've been pursuing are just kind of distractions. You know, Elon Musk in his last uh, interview with Joe Rogan, right? He was saying, yeah, you know, people don't realize if we don't make stuff, there is no stuff. 
And to me, what I found fascinating was the use of stuff, right? It's like, yeah. it is literally just stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because you can't define it. You can't really, you, you, you're basically implying that there's no purpose or no meaning. Yep. You know, like, uh, I think, ha I mean, it's great how many things we've advanced with, right? But mm -hmm. we are just creating stuff for the sake of it sometimes, I feel. Yeah. You know? And that, that comes when you deify markets and capitalism, which yep. is kind of um, a, um, you know, kind of a divisive point when I when within BSV, because yep. there are a lot of people that really fetishize uh, the markets and making <laughs> transactions. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude, you know, and I know we've had a, a journey going through the Bitcoin world, right? And especially you, you know, uh, would definitely love to like, talk to, to you about like your story on, on, on my show as well at some point. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, dude, I think the being able to think across different viewpoints, right. Um, from different aspects, you know, because bit, one thing I can owe to Bitcoin is, um, and, and also Craig, right. Is looking at life through multiple lenses, you know, from Bitcoin, it got me interested in economics uh, more so. It got me interested then in um, mathematics, then more physics, then biology, then, you know, looking at the sociocultural impacts, then even health, um, government, uh, law. And then when you realize, when you start studying all of them, just because you see all the connections, you start to see like um, the biases in all of our uh, opinions on, on things. And even, even Craig has his bias, you know, too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, a single person can only have so many perspectives. Correct. Right. Correct. And so we have to learn to listen too. then, you know, that's where yeah. that's very important. Yeah. So I know, I, I think that's why, like, I always kind of vibe with you because mm. I, I thought, you know, my intuition was that we were kind of like about the same thing, mm. which is to kind of uh, ground people and to uh, help remind them, like, what's really important at the yep. end of the day. Um, you know, it could be interchangeable. You know, you, you talk about, you know, community and tribe and I talk about family a yep. lot. It is. Similar. And, um, you know, I've been really talking about talking about, you know, just taking care of, you know, um, making sure you put, take care of things in a first, first things first yep. fashion. Yeah. And, you know, having, a strong, dependable, trusting family, uh, a partner, mm. is to me something you should be taking care of first. Mm. And what once that is uh, solid, then that will give you the foundation and also just the bandwidth to um, to focus on your professional um, endeavors. And if that's not if that's unstable, mm. I think it bleeds into your 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 uh, your professional life. And I do agree with you at the end of the day, we are, we are still humans that have evolved or that are still adapted to live in small tribes. Yep. And we find great comfort and joy in that. And whenever you have a near death experience, whenever, if you're going to be on your deathbed or even with coronavirus, when mm -hmm. you're like, Oh man, like I might not live tomorrow. Exactly. Your immediate thought is uh, kind of the the small moments, the small things, the intimate moments with the uh, people uh, that you love most. And if you work your way backwards about what you're going to think about on your deathbed, mm -hmm. you can make the right decisions today in order to kind of live a life that you're not, you're not going to regret. Exactly, dude. I, I mean, I took a I took a break. It was my first official one week break off of work um, from 2016 last week, right? And that was such a struggle for me to even set the Your time. Your first week since 2016? Yep. All right? Wow. Um, now, to be fair, right, uh, with that, I have taken, like, workation breaks, right? So it's like I would travel, and um, but I would still be on work-wise. Yeah, 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 you're still Correct. Active. Correct. Yeah. So my challenge this time around was actually like just literally not thinking, not doing anything related to work. And 
it did take me a good couple of days to um, get out of that. And I was so amazed to just discover like how addicted I was to work. Right. And I had a lot of realizations about shit about, you know, how uh, that is connected to like my relationship with my father. Right. Um, like, so my family, uh, they split apart at one point. So my parents went through a divorce. Then I also had a fallout with my mother. Then I wasn't speaking to my sisters for a while. Um, luckily my sisters and mom, my mom and I, we all came back together, you know, stronger than ever. Um, but it's only been recently where I've been, uh, developing some sort of relationship with my father and speaking of COVID, right. He, he actually is the one that reached out, you know, mm. and we hadn't been speaking for a good number of years. And so I think he definitely was also thinking about, uh, damn, you know, like what if I do die? Cause he's in that sixties range, right. Um, yeah. what will I have left, you know? And so I uh, stumbled upon this movie called uh, It's a Wonderful Life from 1947. And it actually, the, the movie takes place during the, the Great Depression, right? The first one, uh, 1929. And it was really interesting to see all the parallels to what's happening right now. But in that film, the protagonist, um, he's, he's put in charge of his uh, father's business. And uh, towards the end of his life, he he thinks about like uh, committing suicide. Right. And be because all the pressures of like business money and he's going up against this other banker and whatnot. And what he realizes though, is that if he hadn't actually spent all of his time uh, helping people, because that's actually what he was known for in town. He kept like, you know, giving himself to help others in town. And uh, there was this angel that was pretty much showing him his life. If he hadn't done those things, and then he realized that like, oh, actually success for me is not the money and the work. Success for me is my relationships with all the people in my community. And in the end, when he comes out of this, you know, um, dream state with the, the angel, um, uh, the entire community bands together to help him because um, I think he was uh, down in terms of money and couldn't pay some stuff. Mm -hmm. And they all came to help him out and like, you know, chipped in. And now it's a difference between him and the banker that was in the story too. The banker had all this money, but he was old, lonely, had no relationships with anybody that weren't transactional. Right. So he was rich and powerful, but you know, for the community, this main character, the protagonist, they said that like, they were like, um, to George Bailey, uh, the richest man in town because he had the most strongest relationships. And I was yep. like, for me personally, that's what success looks like in the future. Right. The money, the money will come, you know, but I think I'm now also identifying role models that actually live life that way than the ones who are uber rich. But if you look into their personal home lives, broken marriages, Elizabeth. yeah, broken homes, yeah. transactional relationships. Fuck that. I don't want that. Yeah. But this is, this is kind of, uh, uh, uh like, uh, kind of heretical because BSV is all about transactions, right? Yes. And, and this, <laughs> And this is why no, I, but it yeah. is really all about transactions. <laughs> yes, it is. So is it? The, you can see the relationships too, right? How people treat some of their relationships. Uh, and this is why I don't say BSV is a community. And I uh, agree with you. I have the same sentiment that like people are, uh, are seeking community. And so they band to other people of like mind um, because they feel like, oh, you get me. Yeah. But, but a lot of times what happens is they are being taken advantage of, mm -hmm. you know, economically, monetarily, in yep. order to use their product or to buy their coin. Correct. And, and we can already see what ends up happening is becomes very litigious. We can see what happened MetaNet ICU, right? There was a few uh, issues yeah. there with, with Joel and whatnot. Um, yeah. And so I'm on, the, I'm on the same tip as you, but... I think for me, when it comes to relationships, I like to give full disclosure up front. Yep. And like, I want, uh, yeah, I've been working on this more, but then to um, let them know where I stand regarding what relationship this is at the moment. Hmm. And a lot of people say like, I'm, I'm kind of like an asshole or whatever, because, hmm. you know, I, I do, uh, reiterate the point that first and foremost, this is first business. Mm. I w and I and I say that because I want to protect people. Mm. Because, yeah, I want to know. Well, at the end of the day, this is the intent. Mm. So, 
they don't feel that they were, you know, misled or whatever if, um, you know, the relationship, you know, doesn't survive or it falls, it falls short. Yeah. Because um, what I find is that a lot of people say, oh, we're community, we're brothers, and all the other stuff. Mm. But then when there's something real happening, it's or somebody created something that's working, yeah. then it's it's business now. It's like, <laughs> all right, yeah. and everybody likes CYA, and you know, you know, does, does everybody you know make sure that you know they got everything written down and, and all that other stuff. Mm. Um, so the way that I see it is, yeah, be upfront with people with, you know, what relationship you're entering into. And then over time, I'm open to, you know, considering you my family or, yeah, you yeah. know, my brother or whatever. But it does, it doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't happen overnight to where I kind of don't like the other way where everybody's like, you know, buddy, buddy. And then it's like, oh. You know, so what? What are you hearing? What are you working on, and mm. stuff like that? And mm. you know, you haven't built that trust yet. Yeah. Um, the second point that I was trying to make is that I uh, I tell this story a lot um, about the, the the value of relationships mm. and how that's too well. And I and I do that to teach BSVers a lot of times why their business model is uh, broken. Mm. Because a lot of things like social media, the goal is to recreate a social environment, a physical social environment mm. online. Mm. So Twitter is like a bar or a public square. Yeah. Right? Um, where in those things, you know, money isn't really moving you know, from hand to hand. So it's kind of weird when people try to put money in all these, you know, different yeah. things. Um, but I tell this story or I, I, I give this explanation a lot because really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to uh, prevent people from moving down that lifestyle to where money and work is everything and they end up very, very depressed. Mm -hmm. So I basically say it like this. So in the beginning... Right, so we lived in small tribes, right? Mm. And we didn't. A lot of people say we had barter, but we didn't. Mm. What we had was we had an internal ledger in our head, mm. and we would do favors for one another, mm. and then we would track how much I gave or how much I helped this person, and then we still do that, the, that FYI. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah, yeah, you know. And the expectation is this person reciprocates, and then yeah. I reciprocate, and then that's how our relationship starts. Mm. So, you know, for example, you know, I ask people, you know, do you pay your mom twenty bucks when she cooks you dinner? Yeah. Hell no. 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 Right. Yeah. But, yeah. Then, well, but according to you know economics, and you know BSV with its you know emphasis on trans transactions, there should be a market for everything, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and then I and then I asked them why, and they're like, because uh, she loves me or whatever. I was like, well, oh, it's not really the right answer. And I, I'm telling, so you know, what you're told is that you're supposed to be completely altruistic, self-sacrificing, and just do it because it's the right thing. That's not the whole story. Uh, what I see is that basically within our small tribes, we engage in long-term reciprocal relationships based on trust yeah to where um because there is high trust i can extend you credit in do, providing you with energy or resources or anything that you need right. and since uh there's high trust i can trust that you will reciprocate for me when i have when i am in need right, right. um that's what family and friends are right yep. so that's why also when your friends help you move you buy the pizza you don't give them 100 bucks yeah exactly um but what happened was one day a kind of a, a nomad or a traveler came through that person's tribe mm. and the kind of the primal instinctual response is i don't trust this person i don't want to have a long-term relationship with this person so let's just kill them and take all their stuff mm. right or just kill them because they might be a threat yeah um, but there was some, you know, you know, some wise person that had foresight that say, wait, you know, 
this person might know something we don't know, or they might have things that we don't have, mm. but I don't trust this person and uh, they're just passing through. I don't, we're not going to create a long-term relationship. Mm. So how can I develop a, a short-term relationship with this person mm. that I don't trust? Yeah. And basically what they did was between tribes, they came to an agreement on a fungible token mm. of value. Yep. Which they can settle a trade, whether it be shells or sticks or salt or yeah. gold or whatever. And then basically said that, all right, I don't trust you. I don't want to have a long term relationship with you, but I like that beaver pill. Yeah. I want it. Yeah. So here's a shiny, you know, gold rock, and we will do this trade because uh, we trust that this has value. Mm. And then I'm going to hand it to you. You're going to give me that and you're going to be on your way. That's so good. Mm. So to put things simply, Money is what you use to get strangers to do short-term transactions with you. Correct. So if you have a lot of money, that means you have a lot of strangers that are willing to do short-term papers for you. Correct. Right? So, you know, you may not be able to have a wife that loves you unconditionally, mm -hmm. but you may have, you know, a, you know, a lady of the night. That, <laughs> lady of the night, yep. Which you can pay for services for, yeah. Yeah, that, you know that's 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 the uh, the difference. Yeah. But what I'm finding is that actually the long-term trust relationship, like a marriage, mm. feels better because it gives you more security. Yes. That you know that even if I get sick or even if I get you know I get injured or lose my job, I'm still gonna have the security of this person that's gonna provide and help for me. Whereas when you have money, it's somewhat a less, it's actually a less durable form of security because you know that, that your career or that value of that money is actually, you have less control over that mm. than you do of investing in a relationship with a person. Yep. Right. So yeah, long story short, that's why family feels so good. Because you know that, you know, they're your day ones and they're your ride or die. Yep, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. There's money, it's, you know, as long as you have it, I'm there. But yeah. it's gone, it's gone. So you're always anxious, you're always on edge. Correct. And, you know, one of the things about family too, it's not, it's not something you can choose, right? You're born with. And you, there are lessons in that of like learning how to make things work with a group of people too that, you being kind of uh, technically forced uh, to be with, right? Yeah, and it's almost like an arranged marriage. Yes. And, and this is where I'm actually a fan of arranged marriages from the standpoint that arranged marriages can teach you to work on your relationships, right? Love yeah. at first sight relationships, they think that like, oh, love at first sight is going to be like this forever. And that's not the case. Because if you stop working on your relationship, stop watering your garden, um, I think that's something also that is a, was a reminder for me over the last week was, you know, take the time to invest in those relationships because there's sometimes right when you're working and like, you know, a loved one or a family member might, you know, try to call you and you're like, Oh, I'm too busy. Right. It's like, fuck, especially if it's your mother. Right. It's like, fuck, your mother is like, you know, spent all that time with you when you were younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then now you're like, Oh, you know, I'm too busy to give time mm -hmm. to this person who invested so much in me. Yeah. And also the, uh, another insight I have about that is that basically my story is that mm -hmm. we don't have anything in common. Mm. right and mm. like we they don't get me we're not on the same page mm. but then i ask myself well how much time did you invest in doing things together yes right um to find common ground on things or to find common interests mm. um yeah and i think that's uh no but that's also profound because i've been thinking about you know family businesses yeah um, and they're very well. strong like, in asia right Family businesses are very yeah. strong and powerful yeah. here in Asia. So basically the thing is you can kill two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. You work on your relationship and you make money as opposed to trying to balance, um, Separate. balance the two. So mm -hmm. it's almost like, yeah, you get money for improving your relationship. And I have this thesis that BSV is going to make the world very, very efficient. Yeah, everybody's going to be on the same kind of economic system. Yeah. And uh, insight that I'm having is that, you know, if you can start a business with your spouse, mm. that is probably the most efficient setup. Yeah. 
Yeah. And hey, what if you threw in like, you know, start a uh, personal training business with your spouse and then you've got the health sorted, and then you've got uh, the family stuff as well. And yeah, you can make money from it. Yeah, yeah. So Elon Musk calls it stacking, which yeah. is basically uh, you knock out multiple things at a, at one time. Yep. Um, and also, um, also having a family business, family owned business as opposed to, you know, maybe like a venture capital backed business, mm. you, you start thinking about, well, I'm going to make decisions so I can hand it down to my children as Long opposed term. to because I need to sell this company to return capitals LP in the uh, seven to 10 years. Correct. And you, you know what I think as well, um, Kevin, it's like we have, if you look at sort of the wealth that has been created by corporations, but you look mm -hmm. at the, the time span of like humanity, right? The amount of wealth that we've created, we're like, oh yeah, this is the best thing ever because we can create so much money. Yeah, yeah. But it's very, it's still a very small part of like all of humanity, right? Yeah. And I think we will realize very quickly as we, I think we're already doing, right? Like what really matters again. So we have this huge spike in like wealth generated and we're saying everybody's better off, but then we might just come back to the same conclusions that our, you know, and did indigenous ancestors like, you know, figured out uh, yeah. with their small tribes and their ability to tell stories, you know, just uh, without any of the technology, like they, they figured some shit out that we discarded because it was part of the past. Right. And we thought that it was inferior. Yeah. I, my great grandfather like just, just like being in harmony with nature yes exactly and right. that's that's one thing i am very big on as well is that i think we definitely need to kind of reintegrate our money system our the way that we live um back with nature because nature is constantly giving us one inspiration giving us life and it also is uh, telling us also timing of things right the seasonal cycles i think yeah. we have divorced ourselves from nature so much that that is also why we are experiencing what we're experiencing. Yeah. Like, so for example, like, you know, um, the fall season is supposed to be like the harvest season, yeah. right? Cause it's like the cold season. Totally. And then the yep. cold season is supposed to be kind of like the hibernation rest. Right. Yep. And then, um, Correct. you know, spring and summer is that, that's when you're supposed to, you know, kind of you know, toil and work a little bit Correct. more. Right. But then, uh, my friend, uh, Artie and Tola, he, uh, works with, uh, Kevin Johnson at Art yeah. Streets. Uh, he basically said that uh, we uh, we uh, march and work to the drumbeat of uh, Wall Street financial quarters. Yeah. Like yep. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, mm. boom, mm. boom, boom. There's no seasonality. Yep. And, when, and you kind of think of it as like kind of a drumbeat for like slaves. Yes. Interesting, huh? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for us sort of uh, harmonizing again and reintegrating with that sort of way of life, but you know, in our own way, right? Like with, I, I think we can make it work with all our, you know, advanced technologies and whatnot. And this is where, you know, I was chatting to um, Michael Hudson, right? From Bitstocks about, you know, like ancient civilizations, right? Lemurians, the story, the myths and the legends of like um, Atlantis and Lemuria. And they had, you know, their crystals and they had, it was very nature-based. Um, and you also look at, you know, some other cultures like, um, oh, even the Mongols, like very interesting, right? They were very, that their God was Tengrir. They believed that they were descendants of the blue wolf. And a lot of what they did, you know, there were stories of like how Genghis Khan would even uh, wait out on a mountain and like pray before actually ad advancing into any new territory, right? Like that level of sort of understanding or connection like to nature, right? To, to, to be on a mountain and wait and pray until it felt right um, to move. Whereas the way that we set ourselves up right now is like we set these arbitrary deadlines and dates without looking at the moon cycles or, you know, the seasons or anything because it's a 24 seven always on culture. And by nature, by doing that, yeah, we just completely disrespect um, uh, nature itself because we yeah, just and, and we, keep going. And we, kind of, and we kind of wear ourselves out because yep. we're out of, out of sync with our natural rhythms. biorhythms yep exactly um so that's you know it's, it's going to be very interesting to see uh what happens like post i feel like definitely this year is like a very pivotal point in time right um i think it's going to set the tone for the next 100 years if we look at just 100 years ago is when the you know the great depression and stuff uh, started happening too 
but um, I, I'm hoping that we can learn our lessons right right now um, and do things differently instead of repeating the damn mistakes because we, we tend to do that. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a it's a progression. Uh, mm. I think George Gilder said it right. We basically have the same uh, resources that the cavemen did. Yep. but we live in a completely different world. Yep. And I think that with every new technology or innovation, there's great things, but they're also unknowns that we're not, we don't know yet. Correct. Uh, for example, how corrosive social media is just to cultural fabric and civic, mm. you know, civic politics, right? Nobody yeah. could have foreseen that, right? Mm. That it would be high like Yeah. I see, you know, social media kind of being treated like cigarettes were by uh, governments yeah um, going forward yeah and uh yeah and I, I yeah i don't think that it's gonna be like a ted kaczynski, ted kaczynski type thing to where we're all gonna go back to log cabins or whatever yeah, yeah i don't think so either but yeah we're gonna you know keep the good and kind of uh and yeah do do it with the bad and, and it's gonna be kind of a an evolution it's not gonna be a regression back to like a dark uh, dark ages. So yeah, but that, but that is also possible too, right? Like I think we often we often often assume that because we are where we are right now, that it's always been a constant evolution. That there was no point in time where we actually did regress backwards, sure, right? Sure. Um, sure. And so yeah, because I yeah I kind of think sometimes too that like I have a feeling <laughs> humanity actually was at a much more advanced or maybe similar to where we are right now at one point in time. And then something mm -hmm. fucking happened and we regressed and then we have to True. do it all again. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is where I think BSP mm. comes in because George Gilder said wealth is knowledge, right? Mm. Um, but what happens is a lot of times our history or our knowledge gets wiped out like in the library of Alexandria yep. and then we have amnesia and then we have to start all over. If we get, if we had like, you know, 500 years of knowledge that was wiped out, mm. then we gotta, basically we got to start all over and rediscover all that. Right. Correct. So what I see with BSV is that if we do have an immutable ledger, mm. then theoretically we won't have to start over again. Theoretically. Because history will always be there. But you could argue right now with the internet, we technically have that now that the information is accessible. The problem is nobody takes the time to look at that as well. So that's great that it's a mutable ledger, that it's there, it's accessible, but how will people be able to access that and you know, incorporate that? Because this is one thing I, I, I feel that the indigenous definitely did figure out. They made as part of their culture, their history in the stories. Yeah. True, true, true. That's so many the cautionary world, tales. World yeah, yeah. Fish. Yep, the oral traditions, right? And they connected it to nature because like, say for example, the Aborigines, right? They have these song lines. So what they did is they connected the history to physical spots as well. And as part of like, you know, initiations or cultural journeys, they would have to sing songs um, down a certain geographical path. They would go on walkabouts, right? They would just walk to all these sacred sites and they would sing the songs and it would give them information about those physical places. We're dealing with, say BSV, a digital landscape, <laughs> right? Um, where culturally we have so many different cultures that there isn't a set, uh, a set one that helps give context or a way to pull in information that is appropriate. Because we can also have a lot of junk that is recorded onto BSV, yeah. which is the, 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 um, the issue with information right now on the internet, right? And then the other, the other worry I have too is that in BSV, there are parties and actors who have almost an intellectual elitist attitude to knowledge and, and what type of knowledge is deemed as right or good, right? And if it's paid for information, then only people who can pay or maybe be able to pay more will be able to say that that is the right or correct information. And I think this does, this should be a conversation we have now because as we know, not everything is a transactional relationship. BSV, Bitcoin does figure out one aspect, which I think is an important part for our next evolution. But one thing it leaves out is actually the culture, the socio, the socioeconomic um, aspects. And that is very intangible and is almost set like from a cultural standpoint needs to be set consciously. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, so basically, um, I've been watching a lot of uh, 
Predator. Yeah. Um, right? Alien Predator yep. stuff. And um, basically, I've been like looking through like the uh, the series, and then um, what happens a lot is that there's a story of um, you know God, and then people trying to become gods by creating their own beings yep. or whatever. And uh, usually, what happens is they create an abomination yeah. against nature, yeah, uh, because they're playing God, right? Like, uh, yeah, the xenomorph, which is that yeah. kind of hideous-looking thing that was created by uh, a creation of humans. Mm. And I, I see this happening a lot in crypto and Bitcoin, mm. to where people don't have the correct cultural awareness of mm. where this thing came from and why it is the way it is and how it's supposed to work. And then they start creating these abominations like you see in Ethereum, BTC, and BCH, because they have these, these kind of very niche, not grounded, either anarcho capitalist, cypher punk, uh, crypto anarchist, uh, um, beliefs, which are very, very, very niche. And it's yeah. usually with somebody's, you know, their profession and they, they try to impose it on everything in the world. And then what comes out of it is just these abominations of products and services and the culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think in the BSV story is that you have to understand Craig, the yeah. creator yep. and his background and what inspired him. Yeah. And um, I see you know, what, what I, what seems very obvious to me is just, you know, the tradition of common law and rule of law mm. and uh have you have you seen my um brand archetype video yet by any chance <laughs> <laughs> i uh, haven't been thinking about it already yeah yet. yeah so yeah. I, I essentially like um uh attach yeah, type of BS Veers. <laughs> yeah so the 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 archetype for the brand of bs veers is the ruler archetype out of the 12 archetypes that there are right You've got the ruler, um, which is all about like law. Then you've got BCH. Uh, they're the rebel or the outlaw. And then um, the BTC is like the, the every, everyday man, right? Mm. Because it appeals to like, you know, the baser um, everyday yeah. man that can get rich quick, whatever. Mm. And so because of, there's those brand archetypes attached to each of them, when you understand it, you realize that you just start seeing the behaviors, right? And you see why they have such conflict with each other. Because again, it's, Whoever were kind of the ones to sort of uh, initiate it, um, they had their ideologies, they had that brand, that they archetype. Their Correct. Views on it. And a lot of times, yeah, I see like Roger Ver kind of like as a tragic figure. Yep. Um, because I know what happened to him in his life. Yeah. And he was, you know, thrown in, you know, prison. Yep. For, you know, for what he thought, for doing something that he thought wasn't that bad or Correct. was you know going against you know his freedom to just yep. you know to transact yep. and basically what i see is that he is um channeling that pain that unresolved pain yes. of his personal story onto his entire ecosystem yes right um yes and yeah, this we're, is we're, uh, yeah this same, is why same with the years. yeah yep no, man. And, and this is this is it. Why it's so important for us to like, yeah, and, and heal, right? Like the importance of healing ourselves. And the sad yeah. thing is that actually a lot of successful people do have that pain, right? And they do channel it. Um, yeah, and sometimes it's that pain that what is what makes them successful. But it's not in a, it doesn't go, it's not channeled in a healthy way. It kind of turns them to kind of like a tyrant or paranoid or whatever. Correct. Correct. Um, and just, yeah, brother, I got two minutes um so uh was there any anything final that you wanted to talk about um before the end of this session <laughs> we could have another um, not really but i will say that you kind of did help me kind of uh navigate um relationships that i'm working with professionally and uh personally good because you know i'm kind of at a crossroads regarding you know thinking that i got to cut somebody off so i can move on to you know another group or whatever yeah and uh my intuition is that there's not a not a uh binary decision there mm. you yep. just gotta keep on yep. working with who brought you yep. 
because yeah, not everything's binary, right? Sometimes there's gray. Um, yep. And it's okay for it to be gray. I mean, shit, like I'm in the same boat as you. Sometimes I also have to remind myself of that. Um, and I, I would say probably one last thing is that, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, being upfront and direct, I think it's important to know what type of relationships you're getting involved with. Because I understand the nature of business too, that actually it is more respectful to be upfront um, in case people, yeah, do confuse, right? Like that desire for family and belonging with yeah. the fact that, okay, I understand that you might have that need or desire, but where I'm coming from here right now, it is a business relationship. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know personally, I do tend to enjoy doing business with people that I get along with, right? Because yeah. I, I do think long-term and I think yeah. there are benefits from a, a sales standpoint and a business development standpoint. Yeah. And going back to the stacking thing, like ideally you want these relationships to somewhat merge. Correct. Correct. Um, sure. But yeah, it isn't always like that. But brother. Yeah. All right. Great chat, man. Um, we yeah. should definitely do it again. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. We'll uh, do a longer session. We can go for hours. Yeah, sounds good, man. And uh, I'll get this recording to you after I upload it. All right, beautiful. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a man. See ya. All right, see you soon. The eyes may be able to see, but without a heart.